mountainbanjos.com. This is the do-it-yourself mountain banjo kit. My name is Brian Carver and in this video I'm going to show you step by step how easy it is to put this kit together. You don't need any special tools, you don't need a special workshop. All the work is done for you. you just put it together and you'll have a fully playable instrument. So stick around until the end and I'll play a few songs for you so you can hear how great this instrument sounds. This book is really what got me interested in building banjos. The very first banjo I made was a mountain banjo. And I followed these plans. That's uh, Stanley Hicks. There's a Leonard Glenn. The concept of a mountain banjo kit has been around for a very long time. This is uh, Dave Sturgill, and looks like he had produced a mountain banjo kit. And this would have been probably in the 60s or 70s. Not sure when this was printed. Yeah, this was published in uh, 73. 1973. So my design is uh, pretty similar to like the Hicks mountain banjo or the Frank Prophet mountain banjo. Really the only difference in my banjos, um, I don't include this middle wooden ring in the body. I, um, I only use two pieces of wood instead of three there. Here you can see uh, there's this inner rim and instead of that I'm I'm actually just routering out a channel in the top plate so it, it serves the same function but it uses a little bit less material it's easier for me to do as a kit so definitely check this book out all right let's get to putting these things together I'm using True Oil, which is a gunstock finish. Um, I bought this online. If you do a Google search, you can find it. Uh, but there are lots of uh, light varnishes out there, and more or less, they're all the same. Or they're going to give you the same finish. So I'm just using a rag and going the direction of the grain. really light coats and I'm um, being careful not to get any oil in the peg holes. When you're varnishing the fretboard there's nothing really special to it you just uh, wipe it on thin. Really that's the trick with the varnish is just keep it thin coats and you don't have any problems. Put it on thin and then I'll uh, just use the clean part of the rag to wipe the frets clean. The varnish isn't really going to stick to the metal so just wipe it clean. I'm only varnishing the outer surfaces. There's no reason to varnish the inside. And we especially don't want to varnish this inner lip here. So that will be important later because we'll be putting glue here. We want it to be able to stick to the wood. So I'm just going to let this first coat dry. 
three or four hours, then I will add the second and the third coats in the same way. This is the steel tone ring included with the Mountain Banjo kit. Uh, I hand roll these and I weld them myself. It's, you'll you'll be surprised at the tone you get out of this. But it is plain steel and uh, I want to give it a little bit of protection from the elements. We'll be putting a wet skin on it. So let's coat it in oil as well. Alright, so I've got three coats of oil on the banjo and I think it turned out really well. I didn't put a whole lot of time into it, but I'm quite happy with the results. Now we're ready to put the skin on. That's going to be our first step in the assembly process. So we start with the top plate. Now, I'm doing all this on the floor uh, because this is the best place for lighting. And uh, just to show you, you don't need anything fancy to put this together. You don't need a workshop. You can just do it right on your floor. So this is the goat skin that comes with the kit. And uh, you have to soak it in the water. Soak it in cold water for at least 30 minutes, up to an hour if you want. Um, never ever put this skin in hot water. I, I've had people boil their skins and I don't know why they decide to do that, but it ruins the skin. So don't put it in hot water. Um, I've already soaked mine here. Don't feel like there's a rush when working with this skin. You've got a good hour um, before it starts getting too dry to work with. I find a lot of people kind of rush this process so they don't get good results. Take your time, you've got plenty of time. So I'm going to lay an old shirt down under this so I don't scratch up my finish. Okay, it's very simple. First thing you have to do is use waterproof wood glue. This is Tight Bond 3. Uh, doesn't matter what brand you get. Just make sure it's waterproof or for exterior use. Putting a layer around this inner lip. It's important that there's no varnish inside this lip. If there is, sand it off. Because the glue won't stick very well to the varnish. Now this glue is kind of like a, a safety measure. Um, we're going to tack the skin on, but the glue is kind of securing it and it will help a lot if, uh, if you go through changes in humidity stuff like that it's going to make the skin more resilient or more resistant to the uh, changes. Uh, it doesn't matter which side you put up or down for the skin, just whatever you want. First we're going to lay the skin down like this. And then we're going to grab the tone ring. I like to put the jointed part of the tone ring down towards the bottom of the body, like where the tailpiece would be. Now we take our top or our bottom plate. We take our bottom plate and we kind of sandwich everything together and squeeze it. So you can see it's pushing the skin up. And that's kind of giving us a starting point 
for the tension of the skin. Alright, let's get these tacks in. So take the tone ring back out now that you've kind of found a starting place for the tension. You might need to use a hammer. Just make sure the tack does not extend outside of this lip because that would interfere with the uh, tone ring. So every time I put in a tack when we're starting this, I uh, put the tone ring back in place and check everything, check the tension. The first four tacks are really important. They're going to be kind of setting the overall tension of the skin. So double check a lot. Make sure you're see we can see that it's quite loose right here, so I'm gonna pull the skin up some more. our first four tacks in place. Let's pop the tone ring back in and squeeze it together. Make sure everything's going to fit. That looks good to me. We've got enough uh, room to play with. The rest should go in pretty easily. Now we've got the four corners and now I'm just going to put a tack. Um, we're just going to divide every section over and over again. I always put one tack in and then go to the opposite end put the next tack in. You don't have to use all the tacks. Uh, you can see I've got them all about, about an inch apart. Now, we'll check again because everything's going to tighten up now. I'm just kind of uh, squeezing the two plates together by hand, and it feels like uh, a good tension. See, we're going to close this gap up completely, so you can kind of feel it, how much weight it takes, how much pressure. If it seems impossible to uh, close it up, you can actually just, you can pry the tacks out. Uh, I would suggest just pry four tacks and then re-tack it a little bit looser. If, if four doesn't do it, take out eight. Uh, you have plenty of time to work with it and you 
can get it right, so don't worry about it. So I think this tension is pretty good. I think it'll close up just fine. So I'm going to take a razor blade and cut along the, the slip. screw all these down. I'm using a power drill. You can use a uh, hand screwdriver. If you use a drill, just be careful you don't over tighten because you don't want to strip these holes out. Just kind of get once started. I don't take them all the way down this first go. So I'll sit screws. time to dry and it'll tighten up even more. I'd recommend just tacking the skin on, giving it a full day, or let it dry overnight before you move on. See there's no gap and no wrinkles. Now let's attach the neck just three screws. All the holes are already made. Make sure the neck is aligned before you tighten it down. take a second to talk about the differences between the fretted neck and the fretless neck. Either one is an option with the kit. If you're watching this before you purchase, all you have to do is uh, just email me when you buy it or leave a message and tell me you want a fretless neck. The fretted neck is the, uh, the one I 
I send out if you don't tell me anything. So first, the nut is a little bit different between the necks. The fretted neck uses a zero fret nut and this means the strings are going to rest against this bigger fret right here. So for the strings to rest here, the strings have to seat in the plastic nut. They need to be all the way down. So you can check that. If you put your string in there and there's a gap between the string and the fret, you know you need to lower these grooves. Easy way to do that is just to fold a piece of sandpaper and use it like a file and you can get in there and bring the the grooves lower. And when you've checked all four of the grooves you can glue the nut into place with a little spot of wood glue. Now the fifth string doesn't have a special nut, there's a little groove in the fretboard right here. So the string will go into this groove and attach to the fifth peg. And the fifth fret is where the string is going to be resting. So that's the fretted neck. Now the fretless neck The fifth string will be resting in a small screw because there are no frets. And then it will also go down this little channel and connect to the peg. Now the nut is a little bit different because there's no zero fret. So you want to make sure you're keeping the string up above the fret or the fingerboard. You want to make sure you're keeping the string above the fingerboard. So I, I set the action a little bit high and you can bring these grooves lower and closer to the fingerboard if you want. Uh, just be careful not to bring it too low because then you might get some string buzz. So that's the difference between the two necks. We'll continue putting this one together now. Alright, I've checked that the strings are going to rest against the zero fret, so let's glue the nut into place. Just a little bit of wood glue. I'm going to clamp it. While we're waiting for this to dry, we can tie the strings onto the tailpiece. Now you can see the strings are all numbered, 1 through 5. On the tailpiece, we go right to left, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The fifth string is the thumb string when you're playing. Your right hand will be striking the fifth string. I have the fourth string here. Put it through the hole. And we're going to twist it two or three times. And put the short end through the eye that you created. basically a slip knot. If you have a better knot, go ahead and use it. I get a lot of questions about how to tie the strings onto the tailpiece and really tie it on as best you can. Uh, if, if you know some fishing knots, use a fishing knot. 
any no slip knot is how you want to do it. Got all five strings tied on. I'm going to trim the extra just to neaten things up. And you see I have the extra on the underside of the tailpiece. Now you'll need a small flathead screwdriver. There are two pre-drilled holes in the body already. Keep in mind these are brass screws, so they're they're softer than steel. And if it seems too hard to uh, screw them in, don't force them because you might snap them. Uh, they should fit fine, but if if not, you can re-drill the the pilot holes a little bit bigger if you need to. Tips for dealing with friction pegs. Uh, first, there's five pegs and one of them is shorter and this is obviously the fifth peg. Now you'll see the peg doesn't go very far into the hole. And I do this on purpose because we know that uh, over time it's going to be compressing the wood around it and it will work its way up over time. So that's what I had in mind when I made these fit so tight. Now right off the bat if you want you can rub a little bit of bar soap on the peg just right here then when you put it in the hole uh, it'll be lubricated and it'll actually go farther up in the hole it'll be easier to tune I kinda do that as a last resort because I like to just keep it bare wood on wood I feel like I feel like it, it stays in tune best that way but uh, you can use the bar soap or maybe if you have a peg that's a little seems a little too tight or it's not going up as far as the others put a little bit of soap on that one. There's also a product you can buy in music stores, it's called Peg Dope, and it's used for violin tuning pegs. It's basically the same thing, it's like a, some kind of a wax. Okay, we'll start with the fourth string. Now, I put the string through the hole in the peg and we've got quite a bit of slack so we'll be able to turn this the string around the peg several times with this index finger here I am pushing the string down and that's very important because if you don't this the string will want to pop off the peg so you have to always guide it down and when I wrap a string I go over the top one time and then I go under the rest and I'm always guiding it down now these pegs are tapered so if you as I'm turning them I'm pushing them up and that's kind of uh, locking them into place. It's increasing the friction between the peg and the peg head. So uh, when, when you're tuning it, you might actually want to pull the peg down. You heard it pop out. Uh, so now there's like no friction there. So it's easy to turn. And then when you approach your tuning where you want it to be, you start uh, working your way up and that locks the peg in. Okay, now for the fifth string. See, we're just gonna rest the string in that channel, a little groove. I think it's important that you cross over. See, uh, you get the string started on the peg and then at some point it crosses over itself and this kind of locks locks itself in place. 
So the strings are on. It's not in tune yet. We still need to set the bridge. So I I get bridges from a few different sources. So yours may or may not have this little notch here. And that notch is basically to help a fretted banjo intonate properly. Uh, it's not really necessary. It's such a small notch, I'm not sure if it actually does anything. But uh, typically a banjo frets sharp on the third string. So this is kind of setting the scale length back just a tiny bit and that's supposed to correct it. So you might get one with a notch, you might not. But if you get the notch, you want the notch to face the headstock. Now the slots for each string, you might have to adjust yourself. Um, I do this, I fold a piece of 320 grit sandpaper in half and just use it like a, a small file. You can get in that groove and deepen it you might find the string uh, just pops out of the groove that means you need to uh, might need to make a little bit wider or deeper to determine exactly where the, the bridge goes you don't really even have to use a ruler but it's a good starting point so we'll start from fret zero right on the edge of fret zero and 24 and 13 sixteenths. So that's about 24 and 3 quarters. So start there. Sounds about right. Might be a little bit sharp, so I'm going to move the bridge this way. There, I think we found it. So that's the spot, I'm going to keep the bridge, and you can mark it with pencil if you want. Now you can tune it up to the key of G, like a standard banjo, or you could tune it a little bit lower if you want, a step or two lower. I usually just tune it to whatever I think sounds good. To standard G tuning and then I took the second string up one more step that gives us sawmill tuning. I'm gonna play the cuckoo and it was made popular by Clarence Tom Ashley. It's a really old folk song that came to America from Europe. <laughs> and I hope this uh, helps you on your banjo building process. I hope this gives you some ideas, some inspiration maybe, and uh, or maybe it helps you in deciding if you want to buy one of my kits. So this is how I make my living. I build banjo kits full time. I've been doing it for over five years as a profession. It's not really a glamorous life, course to be a banjo builder but it gets better every year so I, I thank everyone that's purchased a banjo kit over the years and I thank you if you're considering uh, buying one of these so we'll go ahead and conclude this video I think it's long enough and uh, thanks for watching comment if you have any questions I'll try to answer you or email me carverbanjos at gmail.com or you can get a hold of me over at carverbanjos.com